Emotions are a gift that God gives us. Can you imagine life with no emotions, with no laughter? Can you imagine life with no, you know, not being able to laugh, not being able to you know, giggle at something, not being able to point at the pastor on stage and be like, what's wrong with that guy? You know, it's kind of fun, right? It's kind of fun to laugh. It's, it's nice to have those emotions of joy, of happiness. When you fall in love, that butterflies in your tummy and then it dies so fast and you're like, it turned into a caterpillar again. What's going on? <laughs> However, emotions are not just the good ones, right? We also have the crazy ones too. Some of you are nudging your spouse. I'm like, he's talking about you, <laughs> the crazy emotions. Emotions are so intense, man. It's so wild. It's so widespread. Um, they try to make movies about it. They try to write songs about it. And um, in fact, nowadays we are going back to old Hebrew style of language where we speak in pictures. They're called emojis, right? And when someone sends me an emoji, I have no idea what it means. I'm like, does it mean you want to fight me? Or you're saying fist bump, bro, all cool. You know, I don't understand. Because our emotions are so vast. It's so wide. And our emotions go so deep. And our emotions can give us so much courage Again, I'll use the example of when you fall in love, an uh, introvert will go out and talk to this girl that he totally is head over heels in love with, and his friends are surprised, like, dude, where did you get the courage to do something? Emotions can empower you. Emotions can, can drive you to a point where you excel out of your fears, which is amazing. At the same time, those, so, those, those same emotions can very quickly drive you to despair. Now, I've had classmates and I've had neighbors in India who, on the surface, they seem to be such cool, easygoing guys. And, and one day I heard that they killed themselves. Dark. And you, what happened? Overnight. His relationship fell apart. He was a studious guy. He had a great job. He had a great family. But a life is gone. Those emotions that make you laugh and giggle and give you courage can also drive you to such level of despair and darkness that you fall victim to it. What I want to be talking about is one particular emotion that you and I need to learn not just to harness, but to be healed from it, okay? And if you have your bulletins, you'd have known exactly what I'm going to be talking about this morning because there are times when we have this fire burning in your stomach, this fire burning in your heart. I'm not talking about the refiner's fire, the Holy Ghost fire, jump and dance fire. I'm talking about the fire that needs to be tamed and put out. The fire of anger, of resentment, jealousy, irritation, the need for revenge. I will not sleep until I show you who I really am. That fire that will consume the rest of your life. Now, the world when you study anger, they say that every single person experiences this anger in their lifetime. Anybody over here never experienced anger? Don't raise your hand, man, because I'll make you angry. I'll prove you wrong, okay? <laughs> say, liar, liar, everybody look at him, he's a liar. Be like, I'm so angry now, good, join the team, all right? Every single one of us have faced this emotion of anger, of frustration. Now, as we unpack this passage, you're going to see that it's not just those who are loud and crazy that struggle with this emotion of anger. There are also these people who are calm and cool and they're chill, but even they struggle with this too. So while the world says that everybody struggles with this, my real question is, what does the Bible have to say about this, right? Because I don't care what the world has to say because my Jesus has answers to all the world's questions, amen? And so I was curious as I was reading, first of all, Proverbs chapter 14 and 15, is confusing, man. You, you got to read it during the week and you got to start praying for me, okay? It was really beautiful. I was talking to some volunteers and they're like, yeah, man, I was reading it. I was like, bro, good luck. I have no idea what this is talking about. It's talking about a woman. It's talking about an ox. Is the woman an ox? I don't understand, okay? But um, we're going to be talking about anger and we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 14 and 15. So you're going to get your money's worth this morning. Two chapters, right? But um, that was supposed to be funny. Okay. Two chapters, but the way it works is it's kind of like a, one chapter is 
posing the problem of anger. And the other chapter is giving you the solution, all right? The way Solomon is writing it is he's really bringing this problem of this emotion of anger to the surface. And then he's giving us this, this beautiful answer of what to do with this emotion that can be all-consuming. And in chapter 14, he's really going to help you discern the areas where you are angry. You see, some of us, we've lived with anger for so long, it's just become a part of our personality. Your spouse has gotten used to it and she's learned to deal with it. Your children think it's normal. Even your dog thinks it's normal too. It's like, oh, he's back home, better hide the bones. You know? Okay, the title for this morning's message is very, very simply, Lord, heal my anger. Lord, heal my anger. I was thinking of crazy different titles to put that, you know, will look very viral when it goes online. How to tame the passion in your heart, you know, and um, taming the fire within, with emojis of fire. And, uh, but, but the more I kept sitting on this, I really wanted to title this simply, Lord, heal my anger, because as you read it, my hope is that the Holy Spirit will convict you to make it a prayer and not just something you say as you discern and know and recognize the anger that you have been feeding, kindling. And maybe we'll stop kindling this emotion that can cause us to despair and instead turn it to a prayer and say, Lord, heal my anger. Now, before we read the passage and I ask you to stand, um, I'm going to show you how we get this theme from these two chapters, okay? Now, we're not going to finish both chapters, so take a deep breath. It's fine. We're not going to be here till 3 in the afternoon, just till 2.30, all right? Um, I want to show you how, we get these, how I get this theme of anger from these two chapters. Once again, the book of Proverbs, we're going through it verse by verse. I'm not going to skip any of these verses and, because I want to understand God's Word, and I want to teach you God's Word, and not just for you to grasp what it says, but I also want you to become students of the Bible. So first, let me show you how we get this theme, all right? So when you read it this week, you'll understand what he's really talking about. Um, first Proverbs 14, verse 17 says this. It says, a man of quick temper acts foolishly. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. So we see that if you, if you read through chapter 14, in fact, we're going to see some verses that really spell it out. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it, all right? Like a poem that doesn't just tell you what it is they're going to be talking about. They will introduce the, the topic of what they're really getting at in the middle or on the very end. So the book of Proverbs is something that you really need to have discernment to as you read through it multiple times, keep reading through it, and then you will start to see, oh, this is the theme he's trying to get at. And then you go to chapter 15, Verse 18, it says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. That is, he puts off disputes, he, you know, stops arguments. That's a man of a quiet spirit. So we see the theme of anger, hot-temperedness, the fire that they've not learned to tame and then to put out. Now, this week, like I told you, I'm not going to cover anger exhaustively. We're just going to be looking at the problem that, the anger, that anger poses, this emotion poses, and how the Bible gives us a few pointers in how to deal with this, all right? So even if you think that you don't have a problem with anger, this morning you're going to see areas where you become blind to this. It's not really a fit of rage, but it's there within you. Unforgiveness, bitterness, we all have it. And we're going to see what the Bible has to say about this. Now, in the following weeks, I want to unpack the good side of anger too, because anger can be a good emotion. There are times where we have to get angry, all right? And sadly, in Christianity, we become too passive. We do not know when to be angry, how to be angry. There are things we have to be angry about, and we'll talk about that in the coming weeks. But for now, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 14. We'll read from verses 1 to 13, and then we'll switch to Proverbs 15, 1 to 14. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, and we're going to read the Word of God. So let me ask you to stand as we read the Word of God. Um, it sounds like a lot of verses, but it flows really beautifully. And I think this is going to be a, a sermon that you're going to be able to track and grasp really well. Are you guys ready for God's Word? Yes. Let's read the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 14, picking up from verse 1. The wisest of women build her house, 
builds a house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, ouch, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breeds out lies. A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, but knowledge is easy for a man of understanding. Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. Fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Turn the page over to chapter 15 and the first 14 verses. Here we go. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instructions, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he who loves him who pursues righteousness, but he loves him who pursues righteousness. There is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. Sheol and abandon lie open before the Lord, how much more the hearts of the children of man. A scoffer does not like to be reproved, he will not go to the wise. A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. And that's the reading of God's word for this morning. The three things we're going to be pointing out, as I've already told you, the theme of these two chapters is harnessing the anger that you and I will encounter. There is a way that seems right to the man, and we are not having to guess what he's talking about because we saw those two verses where it talks about rage. It talks about a man who does not know how to harness his emotions in the area of anger. There are three outcomes, three temptations that we have, and there are three outcomes if we do not learn to harness this anger and be healed from it. The first thing you're going to see as we unpack this is we bring wrath on ourselves. We bring punishment on ourselves. And some of you are walking in the pain of the wrath that anger has brought in your life. The second thing we're going to see is you destroy the wealth. Now, in churches, we're too scared to talk about wealth. But the Bible clearly talks about those who are able to walk in the commands of God will be blessed. And if you're not learning to recognize anger and putting it to death, you will destroy the blessings, the wealth that God has given you. And I'm going to give you some examples and you're going to be like, oh my goodness, I see it now. And the third thing we're going to see is, I think the most important thing, how anger will destroy your worship. Let's pray and we'll get to work. Father, once again, we come to you, Lord. Open our eyes this time, especially to the area, the folly of anger. Please, Lord, open our eyes. Lord, many of us have walked too casually, letting this fire burn, thinking that we have a grasp on it. But show us this morning, O oh Lord, how in your grace you are the one who's been sustaining us, but now you're calling all men to repentance and to come to you with this humble prayer, Lord, heal my anger. Save us, Lord, from this unholy fire that burns with passion, that is now burning us up. Lord, I want to thank you now for what you're going to do in the pews, Lord. I thank you now for what you're going to do in the hearts of every single person standing here. I want to thank you now for freedom, for breakthrough, for a complete radical transformation as you pour your spirit into our hearts with a new, fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost that will begin to show the fruit of the spirit in our lives as anger is put to death in our lives, Lord. 
I thank you now for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated and we'll get to work. Number one, please write this down in your bulletins. Learn to take notes, church. It's good for you to learn to take notes. And then go home and use these scriptures as your daily reading if you have to. So God will continue to teach you what you're learning on Sunday morning. Number one, please write this down. Lord, heal me from the wrath of my anger. Lord, heal me from the wrath of my anger. Now, I've, I've told you earlier, I've seen um, many people who look very calm and peaceful on the outside, but struggle with anger. Sadly, there are many of us, we're, we're very unaware of this problem that we have. Everybody else sees it except for you. And sadly, we're living in a world where no one will tell you that because you'll get angry. And they're like, just leave the guy alone, you know? And um, in the world, they will applaud it because your bosses can abuse you because you do not know how to harness your emotions. See, when I was younger, I, well, yeah, I say younger, and uh, even recently, I've struggled with outbursts of anger. Uh, very immature, I understand. Uh, very, very shaming when you all of a sudden you lose control and you're angry and you punch the wall or you scream or you cuss at someone or you're you know pulling your car over and you want to get into fight in the street corner and you know because someone flipped you off or something like that and you know we all go through these emotions and i i personally have had i've seen this in my life right from when i was young i recognized i had an anger problem and i'll tell you in the second point when i recognized this and, and how traumatizing it was when I felt plagued by this emotion that I could not control. It was a fire that kept burning in me, that kept burning me up, and it burnt my relationships. It burnt, you know, my friendships. And there was one job where uh, it was very hard for me to go back because I lost my temper one day, and I ended up doing stupid things because I had a serious problem. And some of you, you know what I'm talking about, when everything begins to go black and there's blood running to your fists, and then it's no stopping you. Got into a lot of fights. I have... Um, even when I, in, when I was a believer, I used to go lead worship and it was really sad. Sunday was a beautiful day, led worship. And Monday, I was in the police station locked up because I got into a fight and I beat a cop up. It's crazy. Anger. Anger. Now, I recognize the outburst of anger that I've had. However, okay, I faced my consequences right away when I was angry. Now, there were other people that I looked up to and I was like, man, I wish I could be cool and calm like this guy. I worked with some people like this, and no matter what they went through, they seemed to be so chill and calm until, until one day when they'd reached their limit. And I thought they were cool and calm, but what was happening was they were kicking things under the carpet. So for me, there was the outburst of anger, and I faced my consequences right away. I lost friends, people blocked me, taken to the cop station, I faced the consequences of it. But then there are other people, they look like a saint on the outside. And all of a sudden, I'm like, he did what to his wife? Wait, your dad did that to you? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, there's an old saying, right? They say that it's the quiet ones you got to watch out for, right? And now, if you are a quiet person, I'm not saying that you struggle with this, you know, harboring bitterness and anger. But what I'm trying to get at is anger isn't always loud or visible, all right? What I'm trying to get at is just because you're not like me, where you're very passionate, you're very outspoken, and, and you show your anger right away when it shows up, doesn't mean that you don't have an anger problem because anger is not always loud or visible. Some people internalize the anger, which can be equally, sometimes even worse, destruction than a person who has an outburst of anger. So while we get into this, I want you to pay attention to areas where you're harboring bitterness unforgiveness, jealousy, revenge. There are some people that will cause your temperature to change. Watch out, okay? There are some people when they walk in the room, you begin to stutter. Your ears go red. For me, it doesn't because I'm brown, okay? <laughs> <coughs> Proverbs 14, verse one. The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Now, I want you to see both outbursts of anger over here. The woman who tears down her own house and the devious person. What's the outcome for both of them? 
a rod for their back. They feel the wrath of the anger. They will get what's coming to them. Now, this is why young people, it's very crucial for you. When you marry a person, marry a person who knows how to forgive, who's quick to forgive, okay? One of the skills that we need to grow in as believers in particular, especially as us as believers, we need to learn to forgive quickly. The longer you hold on to unforgiveness, this anger, this bitterness, this resentment becomes so normal. And I know that in many homes there are women who are tearing down their own house, ignoring their children, ignoring their marriage, ignoring their walk with God because they're looking for revenge. And maybe you're here in this, in this church, maybe you're watching us online. And maybe you're in this church for those very same reasons, because you left the previous church because you got in a fight with someone. And there's unforgiveness and you hop, skipped and jumped from church to church. A foolish woman who does not know how to deal with this fire that needs to be put out will tear down her own house. Bad time for you to walk out to get water or to use the bathroom. <laughs> I love you, my friend. She's not walking out because she's mad, just so everybody knows, all right? <laughs> Chloe's on our worship team. She'll be on worship one of these weeks. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways. Now, we know the context of this is not just a person who is devious in, you know, I'm going to fudge on my tax return. I'm going to fudge on my, you know, um, on my resume when I want to get a job. This deviousness is talking about the dude who's doing things for revenge. Hey, listen, when you're angry, gossip seems like a great meal for you. But watch out, the rod is coming for your back. Ouch. Watch out you might feel like, hey, this is great for me to, you know, I'll go to this different church and I'll do these new ministries and I'll go to these different groups and I'll go to this different Bible study. I'll go to this different job. I'll go to this different, whatever it is, Bible study group, book group, whatever. But if you, I'm not saying don't skip and leave the church and, you know, hey, but set things right. We cannot come and think that it's okay. I can manage this fire. No. No. You cannot do that, man, because anger is a fire that will consume you. Make this your prayer. Lord, heal me from my anger. And then let's get specific. Lord, heal me from the wrath of my anger. It's crucial. It's crucial. When you marry someone, marry someone who can build a house up because they know how to forgive, whether it's man or a woman. Christians cannot have a fake smile when you come to church. You cannot have a fake smile and be like, hey, how are you, brother? And then turn and be like, gosh, I hate him. You know? Now, when I say don't have a fake smile, it doesn't mean you got to be grumpy all the time. Oh, I'm keeping it 100, Pastor. That's why I'm, I just don't like that guy. Oh, okay. Then learn to love that person and learn to forgive that person. Now, in this church, we're going to have people who vote differently. Or well, election season, we're full send. You might see people get in the parking lot in their car and have a bumper sticker that's different from yours. What are you going to do? You're going to harbor bitterness and anger and unforgiveness and resentment? How dare you? No. No, Jesus died for everybody. Can I get an amen, please? Amen. And God's put us in a neighborhood that needs Jesus. We cannot bring our personal, you know, little criterias into the church, into our Christian life. Now, I'm not saying you cannot have your own personal views. Please do. I have my own personal views too. But I'm not going to let that cause let, let that become kindling for my anger, kindling for my frustration. America, as you see the world today, as you see the country today, let your heart break for those who see the lies and think that it's truth. Pray for them. Our anger is not going to change anybody. Praise God that Jesus on the cross doesn't invite us because of his anger, but because of his love, right? Right? Okay, okay. I hope I'm preaching to the right church this morning. Good. Okay, what is anger? I talk so much about anger, and my son, if I was telling him this, he would say, pause, Dad, can you define anger for me? So let, let's just get a quick definition, all right? So just in case you're thinking, well, I don't think he's talking about the anger that I'm talking about, that I'm experiencing, but let's define it. Anger is an emotion that everyone feels. So if you're hearing me and you're feeling uneasy in your seat, Breathe easy, because even I face it, you face it. That's what we're talking about this. We're not just going to ignore it, because this is applicable to everyone, even to the children in the children's ministry. This is, in fact, even more for them. Gosh, I'm so glad they don't have the motor skills to do what you and I could do, man. 
Those children, boy, will have to have World War III and IV all at the same time. It's an emotion that everyone faces. Now, some people call this a secondary emotion. Why do they call it a secondary emotion? Because they say that anger covers up a need that you and I have. You feel threatened by something that you protect, and so it manifests itself as anger, and it manifests itself in various different ways. Um, it manifests itself with frustration, with intense fury, with rage, or with this need for revenge. Um, it, it's a secondary emotion because it, it tries to, it responds to a perceived threat, all right? So in your own life, if you think about the time when you're angry, you need to ask yourself, what was the perceived threat someone was trying to take away my place of comfort, my place of joy, and so I get angry, right? On the road, when you're driving, for me on my motorcycle, when I'm going, I hate it when people are going slow in the fast lane. And uh, we can't lane share over here, so I got to go easy. It's frustrating. And more than frustrating, it makes me angry. Um, and then it's almost like these guys are driving 10 below the speed limit side by. I'm going to hold hands and exchange numbers already. Get married. Come on. You know, you guys are like what, having Bible study over here in this fast lane and the slow lane together. Like, come on, man, pick a lane. But what's, what's really making me angry? Well, I want to I wanna be somewhere because I'm always late. I'm Indian. So I'm like, hurry up, go, 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 go. Why are you going so slow, right? So you see, it's, it's a perceived threat of this person's going to make me late. They're getting in my way. That's wrong. That's injustice. So I become the judge now. And I'm blowing the horn. I'm like, bam, 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 riding right on his bumper. And then he's got this political stick. I'm like, no wonder you drive that way. You know, <laughs> go back to where you came from. Me telling them that, right? <laughs> kind of crazy. So anger is an emotion that is secondary because there's something else deeper that we're trying to protect, all right? So breathe easy. Everybody faces this because we all have things that we want to protect. Now, next week, we'll talk about how you can be angry and not sin. But this week, we're talking about the anger that turns to sin. And I want you to recognize it. Are you recognizing it this morning? Yeah. Very good. I'm glad. Now, no matter the cause of your rage, no matter the cause of your rage, you will face the wrath of your anger, okay? There is consequences to this. Now, we can get into just this whole list of consequences mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, so many different things, but these two chapters in Proverbs highlights things that you and I normally don't see and counselors don't really talk about, and I'm so glad that it does. But let's get to the answer, okay? So what should you do when you recognize anger. Now you know what anger is. What should you do when you recognize this need to protect something that you feel is precious? What are we supposed to do? Write this down, please. Number one, have a soft answer based on truth and wisdom. Have a soft answer based on truth and wisdom, okay? Now, oftentimes the answer is not going to be to the person. It's going to be to you because your emotions are going to keep screaming and say, you deserve this. You pay road tax too. Tell the Prius to get off this fast lane. Can't go fast anyways. You deserve this. Have a soft answer. I should stop picking on Priuses. Have a soft answer based on truth and wisdom. Here's a scripture for it. And I want you to know all these applications is coming straight from the passage that we read, all right? Because I want us to stay true to the passage. Proverbs 15, 1. We're switching chapters now. I told you, 14 is going to pose the problem. 15 is going to give us the solution to the problem. Except for our third point. Proverbs 15, 1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. How many times have you been angry and you speak harsh words to yourself? You deserve it. That person has no idea what kind of a day you had. If only that person knew my childhood, man, they wouldn't speak that way to me. Ooh, now you're getting all riled up. You don't need a preacher, a preacher, a preacher who's brown with dreadlocks to get you all riled up. You are doing it all by yourself. Hey, 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 speak soft words of wisdom and truth. Joel, I know you're psyched right now. I know you feel crazy right now. Hey, but listen, it's just your pride that's getting hurt. It's your ego that's getting hurt. You should have left home in time so you'd be there on time, but you're running late, brother, so don't take your anger out on this person. Hey, a soft word, man, spoken in truth and wisdom is so essential. Breathe easy. I mean, we can go home right after this and you have a lot to apply. But we got more to, more to un uncover. Uh, verse 2, chapter 15 says, The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mounts of fools pour out folly. Now, while you're speaking wisdom to yourself, make sure 
that you're applauding it. Good job, good job. Yes, yes, that's the word of God. That's the spirit of God. That's what we need to go on. Because even in your workplaces, even in your family, you know that what's praised is repeated. Okay? Some of you, you got to learn to pat yourself on the back and be like, hey, that was good. Man, I'm winning today. No, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a sinful thing to do. Because sometimes people don't really have time to look into your life, sadly. We're so busy in this world. You got to be able to take inventory of your life. Like, Lord, search my heart, see this wickedness. And when you recognize, oh, the soft answer is turning away wrath. Oh, hey, I've never been able to see this fruit of the Spirit in my life and I'm seeing it. That's awesome. I'm so excited for more. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Now in Proverbs chapter 10, we spoke about the legacy of the wise is the words that they leave. And if you go out around these buildings, even in the bathrooms, we have these, these outline of that application put out over there. We spelt wiser, which is watch your speech, invite wisdom, speak with restraint, encourage others, and remember eternity. Wise words to watch out for. What do you do when you're faced with anger? When your anger is burning within you and it wants to take control of your life and you're willing to go to any extent to have your way. Pause, slow down, soft answer, turns away wrath. Now, this is not just when you're talking to yourself. This is also when you get into trouble in your anger and you're facing the wrath of your anger. Ever been pulled over and gotten mad at a cop? It's not going to end well. Okay, don't ask me how. But then... If you're soft answer, you're gentle, most of the time it ends well. Most of the time it ends well. When I came to this country, there were a lot of laws I did not understand. My first day in America, I'm not joking, my first day in America, I got into trouble with my in-law's neighbors in their neighborhood. Because my father-in-law had a motorcycle. My first day in America, first time I'm meeting, he said, you want to take the bike for a ride? I said, I'd love to. What do I do like an idiot? In the neighborhood, an eagle, I'm trying to pop wheelies on this bike. I'm trying to see how fast it would go. Because I, I thought, no, I'm not lying. I thought if, there, if you cannot see a speed limit sign, you can go as fast as you want. <laughs> so in the neighborhood, I'm doing 75, 80 miles an hour, trying to pop wheelies. And they live in a cul-de-sac and all the houses look the same. So I'm lost. I'm going into every cul-de-sac trying to pop wheelies. This old guy with his shirt all unbuttoned, weird shoelaces off came. He's like, that young man, that you know how fast you were going? I'm like, 75 miles an hour. You know, he's like, I'll call the cops on you. I'm like, wow, thanks, man. Welcome to America. But, but when I've gotten into trouble because I didn't understand America when I got here, a lot of trouble, a soft answer got me out of trouble. Sorry, officer, I did not know. Oh, really? I should wear my seatbelt? Oh, I should have license? Really? Wow. No, I'm joking. I didn't go that far. All right, but you get the picture. A soft answer. Now, it says over here, Hold on, I lost my page. I got too carried away with America. You guys doing all right over there in the seats? Good. You learning something from this? Hope you're learning more from God's word than about Joel's life. Okay, now, just because you have to speak soft words, just because you have to speak words that are true, but that's, you know, as the Apostle Paul would say, seasoned with salt, doesn't mean you cannot speak with authority, okay? Now, oftentimes we think that, okay, to be calm, to be kind, to be mild-mannered, we cannot have authority. We cannot have passion. Second thing, write this down, please. Speak with authority because of God's sovereignty. Okay, there are many times I've noticed this. I've noticed this in this church, people in this church, where your own family members, <clears throat> they start treating you like dirt. They accuse you of stuff that you no longer are. They bring up your past and they judge you based on your past. They demean your calling. They make fun of your new salvation. And you are like, I cannot get angry. What should I do then? I don't want to face the wrath of my anger. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, listen, you can speak truth, soft words truth, but speak it with authority. You know what I mean by that? That authority doesn't mean you walk around and you start talking like me. This authority recognizes God's sovereignty. Now, we spoke about this too. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. You know what that's talking about? This is talking about God knows exactly what's going on. Again, we spoke about this. The only words that will last forever are words that are true. Words that are lies will be burnt up. So now when you're faced with anger, whether it's within yourself or from the outside, you want to have a soft answer based on truth and wisdom, but you don't have to be a coward about it. 
you could speak truth with courage, with passion, with a smile on your face and say, I know I've screwed up in the past. I know I've had my issues in the past, but you do not know what God has been doing in my life. And I really hope you would give me a chance to show the fruit of the Spirit of God in my life. People will still think you're lying. Hey, I've been preaching for more than a decade in this valley and people still think I'm lying. Okay? But I can still get up over here and I can still live my life with confidence knowing that the sovereign God, like it says, His eyes are in every place. I was talking to my friend last evening and I said, isn't that crazy that God knows when I'm lying and He knows when I'm telling the truth. He knows when I'm making up a fabricated story and He knows when I'm being authentic. And I'm so glad that no matter what comes out of my mouth, if it's true, it doesn't matter the way man judges me. But I'm not going to let man's judgment irritate me to a point where I burn myself up Instead, I'm going to go back to having a soft answer that's based on wisdom and truth, but I will speak with authority and with passion because the sovereign God is watching over every word that comes out from my heart. And I will speak the truth. Amen? Amen. Good. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, um, it kind of tells us, okay, now how should we respond to the invitation of anger? A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Okay. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. How do you, how, wh why? Why should you respond this way? Hey, because a gentle tongue is a tree of life. Now, everything I'm telling you, there's a fair chance that it's going to change your relationship in your homes, in your family, with your parents, some of you with your parents. Because a gentle tongue is a tree of life. Now, I can tell you again from my own experience with my relationship with my dad, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. When you're able to speak the truth with authority, trusting God's sovereignty, when your words are seasoned with wisdom and truth, you put aside your personal preferences and you come back to what is true, what God is doing, and you confront the anger that's burning you up, and you learn to pray, Lord, heal my anger, and then get specific with it, Lord, heal me from the wrath of my anger, please. Don't let the words of people's obnoxious actions, man, and what they say, don't let that break your spirit. Instead, you have the words that are like a tree of life. Now, when I worked over here in the States, it was very, very, very depressing because I came with a lot of experience in various different fields, but none of the places over here wanted to respect that. And I worked for a supervisor who treated me like dirt. Maybe some of you have bosses like that. Some of you are married to someone like that. And it's a very terrible thing when you're trying to start your career from fresh all over again. And no one even knows your name. They don't even know if you speak English. You talk about anger, man. You talk about, I will prove to you. I will show you who I really am. Having to bargain for 25 cents an hour more while I was interviewing for an entry position at a call center. Please, really? I mean, I had my faces on the billboard in India as a radio DJ, man. And I got to go back and thank you for calling DirecTV. Do you want to buy the NFL Sunday ticket? I had no idea what NFL Sunday ticket was, but I had to learn all of that. And it's crazy to be treated like dirt by a supervisor. And I'm working with people who, you know, haven't even gotten into college and just graduated high school. And you talk about anger, man. And I remember the first shift I was working with him, my first break, I came, I called my wife. I said, I want to punch this guy and quit. I'm like, how could he talk to me this way? And I didn't have words then. But what I, what I went through was exactly what I'm preaching to you now. A soft answer. You know what happened that month end? That guy was taking me in his car on the weekends. He's like, hey, come hang out with me. And it's not because I was a good salesman or good at customer service. It's because I didn't react the way other people would have reacted, man. I didn't react to revenge. I didn't say, let me, I, didn't, I didn't work well to prove him wrong. I worked well because God has given me work ethics. God has given me wisdom. God's given me patience. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, joy, gentleness. And if you don't recognize this fire that Satan wants to start in your life, you will spend the rest of your life trying to burn other people down, but you will burn yourself down. Recognize it this morning and repent and learn to pray. Lord, heal my anger. Moving on, there are things that physically will change when you're angry. 
There are things that you physically will experience when you're angry. A lot of people say that anger increases blood pressure. You know, you become more high risk for heart attacks and you, you die quickly when you're angry. But uh, there's so much more spiritually that we see when you give in to anger. What happens if you don't respond to this invitation of praying, Lord, heal my anger? Number two, write this down, please. Lord, heal me from the destruction of my wealth the destruction of my wealth. It's very easy for us to start talking about, well, mentally, this is what it does, and physically, this is what it does, and most of you will say, yeah, I know it, and I experience it, and I have medication for it. But check this out. Maybe you haven't paid attention to this. The destruction of your wealth. Now, you might say, Pastor, I'm not wealthy at all. What destruction are you talking about? Well, let me take you back to when I was seven years old. You ready? Yeah. Downshift. We're going time travel, all right? I was seven years old, and there was these missionary teams that came um, to India, and I know I'm not sure why they're from Sweden, America, Australia. They all sounded the same when I was young, you know? Now, don't be offended. It's all right. <laughs> all Indians sound the same to you anyways, you know? <laughs> and um, they brought these beautiful toy cars for my brother and me, my two older brothers and I. And man, I've never seen toys like this before in my life. They were these beautiful metal, full metal. They don't make them like that anymore, do they? It's heavy, man. And the doors would open, the front hood would open, the trunk would open. It was beautiful. The details in the engine was amazing. I remember it was a red. It kind of looked like, a, like an old Land Rover, you know? Nice. I mean, till today, those are the, my favorite kind of cars, that very square-shaped body. Beautiful toys, and I love playing with it. Um, heavy one, beautiful one. Now, I'm the youngest of uh, three. I have two older brothers, so you know why I'm the way I am. You know, having two older brothers when you're young that way, it's not fun because you're always picked on, and they make fun of you, and Brothers know exactly what to say for you to feel what I'm talking about, that fury of anger. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? They know exactly. They don't have to say anything. They just need to do something, right? And you're like, that's it. I'm going to kill you, <laughs> you know? So I'm seven years old. I'm standing up on these stairs, and I'm playing with my car, and I love playing with my car. I play by myself because I knew my brothers were jerks to me at that stage in my life. Now we get along fairly well, and I'm playing, and my brother said something. I don't even remember what he said. And I can tell you, I remember this even till today because I could, I can even now, I can sense that anger that built up within my belly came up into my chest and I had no words for it. And the blood began to rush to my hand and I picked up this car and I chucked it at him as hard as I could. He was down the steps. Now the problem is when you're young, your aim is terrible. <laughs> and in India, we don't have wooden floors, it's all cement. And so this car, it went flying down, missed him. And I could still see it in the memory of my mind. It hit the floor and shattered into pieces, man. The door, the hood, the trunk, and everything. I remember the roof fell apart. Why do I remember it so much? Because the trauma that came right after that. I remember running down, kneeling down at it, picking up the pieces and crying over it like someone had died. Now I'm 41 years old and it seems stupid to cry over a toy. But even now when I talk about it, I still feel the pain of my wealth being destroyed because I ignored the fire of anger. And then, because it went unchecked, I grew up and there have been many cell phones that have faced the same end in my hands. There'd be motorcycle tanks because of road rage, punch it, and dents. And I borrowed my brother's tank one day. That's probably payback for him making me break my toy, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and his poor bike, man. I was riding, and again, you know, in India, there's no traffic laws, there's no traffic rules. You just ride, and so you're all, I mean, if you think you're a saint, go to India and drive there for a month, all right? And uh, we'll see if your salvation still persists. But... <laughs> Lord, heal me from the destruction of my wealth. Now, why is this important? Look at this. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. What is he talking about? In the context of Israel, the oxen is their tractor, all right? So you plow in the field, you need a tractor. That's what the ox was. It's the old school ox. If you have an ox, if you have a tractor and you're a farmer, guess what? You got to take care of the tires. You got to take care of the oil change. You got to take care of the diesel. You got to have a place to park it. And you got to take care of the oil drips that come. And you got to take care of one day you want to go plow the field and the tractor's not starting. And what do people typically do? It's like, man, I want to burn this thing down. Okay, bring it back to where you and I are. Okay, and I've seen videos of this, so I know I'm not wrong. 
people taking the keyboard of their computer and whacking it because it's slow and it's hanging and the internet doesn't work and they're just getting so mad. They're like, stupid phone, chuck the phone, it's not working, I'm trying to send this email and the third time I had to type it. Listen, if you wanna be productive, you gotta put up with stuff. If you have an ox in the manger, it's gonna poop, okay? If you have a computer, it's gonna get slow. If you have a car, it's gonna break down. Now, why is this important? Because if you don't pay attention to these things that is stirring up this fire, that's lighting this fire, and you're not paying attention to it, you will ignore how much Satan brings anger into your life and it becomes normal. Look at this, he continues to explain this. A faithful witness, okay, once again, we're talking about the ox now. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breeds out lies. Okay, so listen to me now, the verse is up on the screen, listen. A faithful witness, an ox will do what an ox does. It's gonna be faithful to be an ox. There will be dung. It does not lie. But a false witness, what's the false witness in this context? Anger. The false witness tells you, you shouldn't have to deal with this. You shouldn't have to put up with this. And how many of us, because of our anger, okay, 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 mm -mm -mm -mm. sorry America, they gotta do this. How many of us in our anger, you call customer service and the Indian guy doesn't sound as good as me? Um, can I talk to somebody else? Not recognizing that's a human being on the other side. Thank you for calling American Express. How can I help you? Oh, are you a machine or a human being? Uh, I'm a human being. Great. How can I help you? Well, you're the fourth person I'm talking to today. Okay. Well, they said they could help me too. Okay. Well, let's give it a shot. You're going to give it a shot or you're going to help me? Well, I'll do the best I can to help you. How can I help you? Well, I want you to waive off my late fee. Well, I can't do that. Well, that's what the four people said. Well, you should listen to them then. Well, then I want to cancel my card. Do you want me to transfer to cancellation department? How dare you? I'm like, dude, you're just angry, man. Come on, back off. Chill out. You were late on your fee. You got a late fee, you know? And what do we do? Cancel your card. Some of you, you switched your phone plans because you didn't like customer service. Now you're paying twice as much and your wealth is being destroyed because of your anger, your pride. You got mad, you broke your computer, and now you don't have a computer. And now you're blaming other people, being like, yeah, I don't have a computer, so I'm unable to get a job. You got angry at your car, and so you sold it, and you shouldn't have, instead of actually saving money and fixing it. And now you got into debt, and you bought a newer car, and now you're depending on other people to help pay off that EMI, because you shouldn't have done it, and your anger is destroying your wealth. Am I talking to someone this morning? Good. Good, because these are things that we oftentimes overlook. And the world will applaud you for that. They'll be like, way to go, man. Way to take your life and do it. Oh, good, yeah, no, just buy it. It's fine, it's easy payments. How many of you guys have easy payments, like five different easy payments and it's not easy anymore? And you've gotten that because of your pride, your anger that was not checked. Lord, heal me from the destruction of my wealth because of my stupid anger that I need to put out. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 6, a scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, Ooh, but knowledge is easy for a man of understanding. What does he mean? Not everybody who seeks wisdom is doing it for the right reason. Some people will search for, in this context, an ox, but not for the right reason. Like I just said, oh no, I want to buy a newer car, not for the right reason. I want to upgrade my phone, not for the right reason. I want to change my phone plan, not for the right reason. I want to get to a bigger house, not for the right reason. I want to work hard so I can save money, not for the right reason. You're doing it because you're fueled by anger. You want to prove someone wrong. You want to prove that you were right and they were wrong. Stop living a life that way. Lord, save me from the wrath that's coming because of my anger. Save me from the destruction of my wealth that's coming from my anger. You know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you, you drive cars today just because you're trying to prove someone wrong and you're unable to pay for it. You want your life on social media to look so great, but deep inside you're, you're burning up with anger. Don't kill the ox because it poops, man. Put up with it. You need it to plow the field. What about the oxes in your life, okay? In today's context, this is a person who will work and save and buy and they look good on the outside, but they're fueled because of anger. And anything that gets in the way that hinders this anger being able to burn longer, they put it to death. And that's a bad thing to put to death. But a person who's understanding, a person who's listening to this and saying, man, I see this in myself, it says that wisdom comes easy for them. All right, application again. 
for our second point, how do I overcome my anger? How do I overcome these angry situations when things, practical things in my life is fueling up this anger? How do I do that? Well, Proverbs 15, 5 gives us an answer. It says, a fool despises his father's instructions, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. This is very easy then to apply. It says, listen to wisdom and not your emotions. What must you do when you, these things around you is causing you to be angry? Now, this is not just like people. These are things that's making you angry, the ox, whatever it is in your life. It's causing you to fuel up, to live a life, to change the way you live so that you can prove these things or people right or wrong. What must you do? Listen to wisdom and not your emotions. Why? Because emotions, although they're great, they will lie to you. Listen to wisdom. Now, once again, I can hear my son in my head saying, okay, dad, then what is wisdom? And I would say, haven't you been listening to Proverbs? We've been talking about it all along. Wisdom is this, folks, and if you have forgotten, write it down. Wisdom is actions that come from understanding that will display the purpose, the power, and the plan of God. Wisdom is not just, oh, that's a wise guy. He knows a lot. Many people know a lot. AI knows a lot. The internet knows a lot. Okay? Our politicians know a lot. Wisdom is not knowing. Wisdom is actions that come from understanding. Are you acting on it? That's why there are so many people, they know a lot, but their life? Absolute fools. Oh, but they will talk up a, good, a beautiful game. But when you watch the way they live, when you watch the way they walk, you go to their home, you watch their children, you watch their marriage, you're like, oh, that's an idiot. No, it's truthful, man. But, oh, but they, on social media, they look great. Wisdom is actions that come from understanding. Understanding what? Understanding God's ways, man. Understanding the character and the nature of God. That's why we got to spend the rest of our life learning more about who God is so we can become more like who He's calling us to be. Wisdom is actions that come from understanding that will display the plan, the purpose, and the power of God. I preached a whole sermon on that. I'm not going to get into it. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 6 says, In the house of the righteous, there's much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. You see how 14 and 15 just really mesh so beautifully together, almost like parallel side by side. Anger will destroy your wealth. But for the person who really is seeking the wisdom of God, there's blessing. In the house of the righteous, there's much treasure. Why? Because he's not killing his ox. He's wise. He's slow. He's not going to let his anger get in the way of his decisions. He's not going to make decisions out of frustration, knee-jerk reactions. But trouble befalls the income of the wicked. Are you letting anger destroy your house, ladies and gentlemen? Are you letting anger destroy your finances? Are you letting anger destroy your savings? Are you letting anger destroy your expenses and what you should be spending on, what you shouldn't be spending on? I hope we're not living lives that is trying to prove to others how successful you are. But I hope our lives is really a reflection of God's success that he's put in us. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9 says, Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the hearts of fools. Make this your prayer, please. Lord, heal my anger. Here's another application in our second point. First, we said, listen to wisdom, not your emotions. And then once again, it reflects what we saw in the first point too. Speak with restraint. Speak with restraint. Hold back. Hold back your words. Proverbs 15, 7. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools. Once again, when, you're, when your emotions tell you, go for it, man. Do it. <laughs> tell your emotions to shut up. You're a liar. I'm not going to go for it. Although I know that right now it seems like strike when the iron is hot. No, I'm going to wait on it. I'm going to pray through it. I'm going to fast and pray through it before I make the decision. See, when I was younger, I keep saying younger. Some of you are like, you're still a young whippersnapper. Well, yeah, <laughs> my back would beg to differ. But when I was younger, man, this is exactly how I was. Ah, knee-jerk reactions. Just make decisions as you come and go. And I, and I remember doing it all because of my own anger that was lodged in my heart. And for a lot of it, it was trying to prove my dad wrong. Even my spirituality, even my preaching many times was just trying to prove my dad wrong. Because my dad said, I'll be a drug addict and I'll come crawling on my hands and knees to his house and he'll throw me out again. And I was like, well, I'll prove you wrong, dad. And God does not want us to live that way. Because a fool will seek wisdom for the wrong reasons. I don't want to be a fool. Do you? Three people don't want to be fools. All right. 
<laughs> let's change the name of this church. <laughs> if you haven't picked up already, anger will ruin your home. It'll ruin your family. It'll ruin your relationships. It'll also affect your jobs, your careers, your material blessings. Number three, the worst of all, and this, this really should move your spirit, it will ruin your worship. Number three, Lord, heal me to worship you again. Is there a fair chance that you came to church this morning and you couldn't worship because there's bitterness in your heart? Because there's a fire burning, but it's not burning for Jesus. It's not burning for repentance. It's not burning for obedience. Hey, can I even take it a step further and say maybe you are, your fire that's burning is anger, maybe even towards me, maybe towards this church, maybe towards some of the volunteers, leaders over here, maybe towards some of the things we do. And is your anger putting a stumbling block in your worship? Maybe I remind you of someone that you don't like and you're angry at that person and that's hindering your worship. Now I say this because it's very true. <laughs> I'm guilty of this many, many, many times. I see certain mannerisms and it rubs me the wrong way and I'm like, I hate this guy. That's not right, man. That's not right at all. Gosh, that's terrible, especially when you're a leader. Lord, can you make it your prayer? Lord, heal me so I can worship you again. What a beautiful song. Lord, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. All about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it when it should have been all about you in the first place. And I thank you so much that you're bringing this to the surface now. I see my sin. Be humble to repent. Lord, I see it, Lord. Heal my anger. Jesus' words now, you know, Jesus' words should be taken seriously like every other part of Scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 says, So if you're offering your gift to the altar, at the altar there and, and you remember that your brother has something against you, look at this. He says, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Wow. Now, for Jesus, you need to know the map of Israel when he's saying this. Galilee is about... I mean, if you're being, you know, kind, it's about 120 miles away from Jerusalem. Jesus is saying, see how absurd this sounds, all right? Hey, listen, man, if you come to worship and you know that your brother has something against you, you leave that pigeon, you leave that goat, you leave that lamb, you leave that rice or whatever you brought, and you go make the hike back 120 miles. How many of you are ready to do that? You come to church and you're like, hey, I know pastor said don't be late, but I got to go be reconciled. I'm going to turn around and go back. No, no, stop. I'm not saying send a text, make a phone call. First of all, our relationship has to be right with God. God is saying, if you're going to come to worship, I'm not going to accept your worship if you're coming with anger in your heart. That's the point. The point is, if you want your worship to be acceptable to God and not an abomination, a stench, a stink, like we're going to read, he's saying, get Write with me by following my commands. Recognize your anger and deal with it. Make it your prayer. Lord, heal my anger. Otherwise, your worship is noise. Hey, you can sing high harmonies. You can sing this and that and sound great like Taylor Swift. Although I don't think she sounds very great, but that's a different story. <laughs> God is not pleased with that. Showing my prejudice, isn't it? <laughs> she sounds like Taylor Swift. She can't be on the worship team. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm joking, guys. Come on. Lighten up a little bit. Maybe we should open the coffee bar again while I preach. <laughs> Is Chloe back? She's back. Good. I thought she's like, no, I'm not a fan and walked off home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> back, to the, back to the message. If you want to be a true worshiper, you cannot have room to harbor bitterness. Did you get that? Did I make that clear? You cannot have room for this unhealthy anger that's burning you up with jealousy. You cannot stand here and sing with your hands raised while you're like, man, I can't stand that person. No. And maybe you're not ready to talk to that person yet, and we're going to see more what that actually looks like this week and next week. But you got to get right with God and say, Lord, I first want to be made right with you. Your word says I got to reconcile. Lord, help me to reconcile. But for now, God, heal me from my anger. Heal me from my anger. Proverbs 15, verse 8. You see, now Proverbs 15 is going to pose a problem, and 14 is going to give us a solution. 15 verse 8, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to Him. You see that? Everything I've been talking about right there. 
The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. The word over there, to put it simply, is it's a stench, a stink. It's like gutter water. God's like, I hate it. So what Jesus is telling us in Matthew is not really a new command. It's an old command that's always been there. But it looks like people haven't been taking it seriously back then. And there's a fair chance that even we have not been taking it seriously here and now. This kind of worship makes God sick. He's not impressed with it. He doesn't like this kind of worship. Verse 9 tells us in chapter 15 of Proverbs, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Once again, he's underlining it, showing that it's important. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who pursues righteousness. What's the outcome of forcing your way? So you come, you hear all this and you say, good message, Pastor. Great. Wow. The way you made both those passages dance together. Wow. That was beautiful. Okay, great. But is it changing your life? Well, I don't care about it, but I just come to see how, what you're going to do with the passage. No, that's not the point. Is it transforming your life? Is the transformation manifesting itself in the way you live? What happens if you choose to go back out these doors the same way you came and not making this your prayer? Lord, heal my anger. What's the outcome? Verse 10 tells us in Proverbs 15, there is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. Ish. Crazy. The severe discipline for whoever forsakes the way. Now, I looked into this in Hebrew. The way just means the journey, the path, the road. But I couldn't help, and I'm sure you too cannot help but go to the book of John where Jesus says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And do you see this right over here? You will surely die. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the life. This, word, this thing says all the way we've seen, hey, seek wisdom, walk in wisdom. Jesus says, I'm the truth. I'm the way, I'm the life. So permit me for a few minutes now to talk to you about the gospel, the good news. Every week you come here, you're going to hear it. Don't get bored of it. It's good news. It's not old news. It's not stale news. It's good news. The best news you will ever hear. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end will lead to destruction. We're going to see this right over here in a few verses coming up. But Jesus says, there is a way and I am the way. There's only one way. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And here the warning says anybody who forsakes the way, anybody who says, I don't care about my anger, I don't care about the fire that's burning, I can deal with it. In fact, that's what's fueling me, that's what's keeping me in leadership that threatens people, people, you know, respect me, honor me. They don't, bro, they hate you. They don't like you. They just don't tell it to you to your face because they know that you'll flip. Hey, there's a whole different way of respect and love and relationship when you come with humility and love and transparency. Your children with, with tears will confess what they're struggling with with you when they don't have to tiptoe around you not knowing if you're going to get mad if they talk about how they failed. Lord, heal my anger. Lord, heal my anger so that I can walk in the way, in your way, so I can walk in truth, so I can walk in the life that you've given me. You see, in uh, John chapter 14, it's not going to be up on the screen. Thomas, the disciple, he says, Jesus, we do not know the way of where you're going. And Jesus says, Thomas, I am the way. I, and I told you this last week, Jesus is the most inclusive, the only, not the most, sorry, the only inclusive, all-inclusive Savior of the world. No other religion, no other worldview has such an invite. Let any man, let any woman, whoever you are, come. There's a room for you at the table. The cross on which Jesus died invites every single person. He is the only Savior that's ever claimed to be a Savior that is all-inclusive. And He's also the only exclusive God. There's no other worldview, no other religion that's as exclusive as Jesus because nobody else dared say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Catholics might be changing this theology now and say, oh, no, no, there's different roads. Well, they are going to hell based on the authority of God's word. There's only one way that leads to the Father, and that is through Jesus on the cross on which he died. He is the way, and I want you to get this. If you leave these doors saying, I can figure this out, you are not walking in the way of life. You're walking in arrogance and pride, and you can go from church to church, and you can, feel, you can fool pastors, you can fool theologians, you can fool churches, you can even fool your own family. But as we're going to see, you cannot fool yourself, and boy, you cannot fool God. 
And this morning, I know the Word of God is holding the mirror before you and saying, what are you going to do? Are you going to be consumed by the fire of anger? Or are you going to cry out and say, Lord, heal my anger? How do I deal with anger that hinders my worship? We're going to get to that. The severe discipline, verse 11 of um, chapter 15 in Proverbs, Sheol and abandon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of man? Once again, church, I want to tell you, God knows exactly where you are. And the fact of the matter is, as you hear the word of God, you know exactly where you are this morning. And if God knows the place of the dead, if God knows the place, even what's happening in hell, does he not know where your heart is? Why do you fight the invitation to come and to cry out, Lord, heal my anger? Verse 12 says, A scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise or he will not go to wisdom. Um, it's really sad that even after this, not everybody will respond to this. Isn't that sad, church? That even after this, people wouldn't respond to this invitation. I want to read for you. Um, it's not going to be up on the screen, but from um, the book of Galatians. It's quite a long passage over here, and I didn't want to put it on the screen. But before we close with the closing statements from Proverbs chapter 14 and 15, I want you to finish writing down your notes if you're writing. And I want you to just listen to this, okay, please? Would you do that? If you want to close your eyes and listen to it, you can. I want you to receive this because I know that there are some of you who are still going to fight the invitation from the Spirit of God. And I know that singing a song is not going to do it. But the Word of God, with the Spirit of God, will bring the conviction of God. What man cannot do, the Word of God is going to do. So this morning, if you're struggling in your seats, saying, Pastor, I'm having a hard time recognizing the fire in my heart that's burning me up. Pastor, I, I recognize it, but I, I don't have the zeal to pray a heartfelt prayer. I want you to please close your eyes and I want you to listen to the word of God. This is Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, and dare I add, and only those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Amen. What I want to invite you to do this morning while you pray that prayer is to say, Lord, I want to crucify my flesh. I want to crucify my flesh, Lord. I want to crucify my way and I want to get on your way. And I hope that you're not the scoffer who doesn't like to be reproved, corrected, but I hope you're leaning on the wisdom of God. But now um, everyone is going to respond. When you leave these doors, transform, change. Not everyone is going to applaud it. There are people who take advantage of it. Right? The disciples were all killed. Because when you're walking in the Spirit, people will take advantage of it, okay? Listen, every single person who was baptized last week, I've been fasting and praying for you this week. Because when you say publicly, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior, the enemy is going to come after you. Not once have I heard a testimony of someone said, I gave my life to Jesus and, and everything was smooth sailing. No, all hell breaks loose around you, man. And, and when I preach a message like this on anger, and I'm really kicking up, you know, tearing down hell's plans, 
and pointing you and saying, watch out. This week, I know the enemy is going to come and attack you. And as I'm saying it right now, I feel the weight of it in my own life too. So I'll be praying for you. You pray for me also. What do you do? How do you deal with anger that hinders your worship? What are you going to do when anger comes your way? I've already given you a few applications. Here's a few more applications for you as we bring this to a close. Okay. When anger comes your way, that's going to hinder, that's going to bring the wrath of your anger, that's going to take away your wealth and the blessing of God, that's going to hinder your worship. Know when to walk away. Okay. What do you do when you're angry? Know when to walk away. Know when to walk away. Um, my dad, he was a karate instructor and grown up a whole life, man. Like ever since we were a child, we had to get up in two hours of karate in the morning and then two hours of karate in the evening. And uh, it was pretty crazy. But my dad would always tell me when we went to school, he'd say, if you get into a fight, Joel, walk away. He said, run away if you get into a fight. Don't fight, run away. I didn't understand. And apparently it's Bruce Lee saying, he said, if you get into a fight, run away to save that person's life. Because he said, you don't know. And, and, and I didn't realize how much you learn to punch and kick. And, uh, and then after you get into a few fights, you're like, whoa, yeah, I got to be careful with this. I'm not saying I'm Mr. Tough Guy. When I was in school, poor malnourished Indian kids, it's easy to beat them up, you know? Hey, I was one of those to calm down, all right? <laughs> but spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, hey, this is a real church, all right? Come on, let's get real. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, this is the ox you get in this stable, all right? <laughs> Don't shoot the ox. Spiritu <laughs> Greg, you need to stop laughing so loud, bro. You distract me, man. Spiritually speaking, know when to walk away when someone is triggering you. Know when to walk away when someone is stealing the joy of the Holy Spirit. Know when to walk away when the Holy Spirit says, this is not where you're supposed to be. Don't indulge in this conversation. Don't give them another minute of your time. You see, your words are so powerful. Your words are amazing. It's, the, it's, it's a very powerful gift that God's given us. I always tell my children, I said, if you lose everything in this life, even your clothes, you're naked on the street corner, you still have your words. So use your words wisely. Your words are so powerful that the Bible says that it has the power of life and death. Know when to walk away. Don't waste words on people. This doesn't mean walk away from the coffee shop. This means walk away from Instagram, walk away from Facebook, walk away from TikTok, walk away from Truth Social, walk away from Twitter, X. Walk away. Walk away. Be like, I know that email came in. I'll deal with it when I've spent some time praying. Walk away from the comment section. Know when to walk away, man, because sometimes... The enemy will use these things to kindle your anger that will bring the wrath of your anger, that will destroy the wealth, your blessings, and that will hinder your worship. Leave the presence, Proverbs 14, 7. Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not need words of knowledge. Now, if you have, okay, maybe I shouldn't ask you to do this, but this is what I'm going to do. If I'm surrounding myself consistently with people who nag me, I'm going to put this verse on my phone. And I'm, Going to pull it up and be like, leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. Thank you, Lord. See you, bro. Bye. You know? No, really, man. You got to learn. That, that's how God's word actually, you know, kind of coincides in your real life. Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. How many times you wasted your life trying to talk to someone who just does not want to listen? Now, you want to be reconciled with someone, but there are some people who don't want to be reconciled. It takes two hands to clap. And sometimes you're like, okay, I don't want to be angry. I got to be reconciled. Jesus says, leave your sacrifice and go. And you can go 120 miles. And this person be like, well, I know what you did when you were 13 years old. I'm like, bro, I'm talking to you about now. Will you forgive me and let it go? Well, I don't know about that. Well, okay, thank you. Praise the Lord Jesus. I, I'm doing the best I can. I'm releasing anger from my heart. I'm releasing this person. I'm walking back, leaving the presence of a fool. For here, I'm not going to meet words of wisdom. And that's not being prideful. That's being truthful. Okay, wisdom, writing in scripture, is supposed to build your muscles of faith. Proverbs 14 verse 8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. Don't fall to the deception of fools, but have discernment to know when to walk away because the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way. Discern. Walk in discernment. Walk in discernment. Just because I'm doing something doesn't mean you have to do it too. Walk in discernment. Okay? It might not be the season for you to go and reconcile with family members. Walk in discernment. Proverbs 14, verse 9, fools mock at the guilt offering, 
but the upright enjoys acceptance. Fools will mock at the idea that worship is hindered by anger, by unresolved issues. Fools will mock it and be like, oh no, I know God. I can. Many people think they can talk their way into God's presence, you know? Fools, they mock the idea of truth. Don't be one of these people and don't give your time to one of these people either. Verse 10, the heart knows its own bitterness and no stranger shares its joy. Once again, like I've been saying, everybody sees how bitter you are. Oh, your smile looks great. Your perfume smells beautiful. Haircut, perfume, makeup, all on point. But your heart, that's what shows beyond all of that. Do you know what I mean? You see some people and you're like, well, they look great on the outside, but boy, I can sense bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, anger. That's why I said you cannot fool yourself. Even your heart is a witness to everything that I'm saying or we are saying, bro, you struggle with this. Everyone sees it. Do you see it for yourself? Okay, closing statements from Proverbs 14 and 15. You're doing all right? Yes. You're still alive? You're breathing? Very good. Closing statements. Proverbs 14 verse 11 says, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Isn't that what we saw in verse 1? The foolish woman destroys a house. That's what we're capping off over here at this part of the passage because he's bringing this thought to a conclusion over here. And then he's going to start a new thought on the theme of anger. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We spoke about that. There's only one way that leads to life, and his name is? Very good. Verse 13 says, Even in laughter the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. He's saying that if you leave these doors, if you listen to this and you say, I'm not going to pray, Lord, heal my anger. I think I can deal with this. Even your joys will lead to grief. If you're the only one looking for a good time and you're not looking for God's time in your life, even your laughter, man, will end in grief. How terrible is that? I know some of you, you know what I'm talking about, where you're having a good time and you know you got to pay for it the very next day. And God is saying, stop living that way. Come, get on the way, the truth, the life, where your joy, your laughter will come from the very presence of God and that doesn't mean you walk around looking like a holy Joe. No, you walk around being authentic to who God made you to be with courage and power and love and a genuine smile. Closing statements from chapter 15, verse 13 says, A glad heart makes a cheerful face. Do you have a cheerful face? Uh, you guys look like a mirror image of me. You're like, I even wore my glasses today too. It's like, wow. <laughs> a glad, everybody's like trying to force a smile. And I'm like, yeah, I'm happy, Pastor. Stop being fake in church. <laughs> a glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feed on folly. Okay, what, is, what, what, what do we conclude with? Well, surrender your heart to the way, whose name is Jesus. How do you do that? You cry out, Lord, heal my anger. In today's context, we surrender by saying, Lord, Heal my anger, Lord. I recognize it. Heal my anger. And then we receive healing. We don't just cry out. Listen, we're a church that believes that God still heals. Do you believe that God heals? Do you believe that this morning God can heal you from resentment, long-term unforgiveness? Maybe your dad is dead and gone, but you are still holding on to unforgiveness. I believe that God wants to heal you this morning. And when we cry out, Lord, heal my anger, we expect God to heal us. And you know how we expect that? By walking in the commands that he's put before us so that we can start walking in this healing. And what are those things? We saw those five things. Have a soft answer based on truth and wisdom. Speak with authority because of God's sovereignty. Listen to wisdom, not your emotions. Speak with restraint and know when to walk away. If you didn't take notes, take a picture of that, write it down. We're going to pray for healing. Lord, heal my anger. And the way we walk in faith shows that we're like, Lord, I recognize the stench of my anger. I recognize how much is killing me. And I don't want to live in my death anymore. You've called me to new life. And so I'm going to start walking in this this week, starting from now. I'm going to start learning to have a soft answer that's based on truth and wisdom. I'm going to start looking for ways to speak with authority, trusting your sovereignty, not my flesh, not my ego, not my pride, not my money, not the way I look and not what I drive. I'm going to listen to wisdom, God. That means spend time in your words, spend time in prayers so that my emotions don't lead me astray or other people's emotions don't lead you astray. 
speak with restraint. God, I'm going to put a guard over my mouth. I'm going to stop. And then I'm going to have the courage, Lord, to know when to walk away when I'm interacting and arguing with fools. Can we do that this week, church? Yes. Can we do it starting now? Yes. Praise the Lord. Would you please stand? We're going to pray. And we're going to ask God to heal us. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you are a healer and only you. Uh, the world tries to medicate us, counsel us, sing songs to us to try to harness our emotions, but we know that those things, although can be a, a band-aid, a, a fix, and you can use those things too to speak to us, but we know that all our healing comes from you, Lord. Whether it's the medication we take or the counselors we talk to or the music we listen to or the books we read, you are our healer. And we want to, as a church, Lord, we want to confess, Jesus, you are my healer. You are my provider. You are my savior. And this morning, Lord, we cry out, heal our anger, Lord. Collectively, as a church, heal our anger. Individually, Lord, please meet us, Lord, where we've been burning up and heal us, Lord. As we faced vast emotions of highs and lows this week, Lord, help us to depend on you especially when we're faced with the emotion of anger. Whether it's an outburst of anger or whether it's a deep, dark secret that we've been hiding for years, for decades. Heal us, Lord. And prepare us for next week too as we put this message into action. Prepare us for next week, Lord, on how we can be saved and angry and not sin. Give us the freedom, O oh Lord, not to have to walk so cautiously that we're walking in fear, but walking in freedom, knowing that we're holding the hands of the Creator of heaven and earth, our Savior, who knows us fully and who accepts us fully and who loves us so dearly. So, Father, as we stretch our hearts out to you, asking for healing, as we lift our lives as an open book to you, Lord, saying, Father, heal us. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us courage to trust you now, knowing that as you do surgery on our spirits, we will begin to see the difference as we walk in faith. I thank you, Lord, for your healing hand. Lord, I pray that this week, the things that typically would drive us to a place of anger, that your Holy Spirit will stand guard and speak to us and save us, O oh Lord, from the wrath that comes from anger, from the wealth that is destroyed, and from a worship that's hindered. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for wisdom to understand your word, the Holy Spirit to apply the word. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith to receive your word. And now, O oh Lord, let your grace, the beautiful gift that you give us, that we so desperately need to get through, let it be multiplied on this church, God. Your beautiful grace. Thank you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit put out the fire of anger once and for all that's been burning you. And instead, let him replace it with his refiner's fire that burns away the hay, the stubble, and the rock that melts the gold and makes it pure. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Let's go live lives that are free. Amen? Amen. All right.